Okay. Okay, let's get started. We've got a lot to cover, and uh, and we want to get started here. Okay, I have been handed several uh, questions here. Uh, the first one is, do all plants absorb the same amount of minerals from the ground? No. Um, uh, different plants will absorb different uh, minerals from the ground. And um, uh, for instance, alfalfa will, uh, yeah, will have uh, different things than uh, other. If, if, uh, if you're growing a crop of tomatoes, I'm going to give you different uh, um, minerals and different recommendations uh, than if you're growing lettuce. Uh, so it depends on what we're growing as to what comes out of uh, what we're going to put into the ground there. <clears throat> okay. Besides profit, do we know the reason behind commercial minerals, uh, pharmaceuticals? Well, I don't know any. Um, we've got to get results. We've got to get some results or, uh, you know, nobody would, uh, uh, would pay attention to it. Uh, the thing is, uh, we can get results. Let's say, let's say I got up this morning and I wasn't feeling good, and uh, so I drank a cup of coffee and had a donut. Would that make me feel better? Uh, well, yeah, it would make me feel better. <laughs> but it's a false uh, stimulation, isn't it? There. So we can do the same thing with our plants, um, and we do. We pour on the nitrogen and we pour on the uh, potassium <clears throat> and so that blows up our plants that's what they call it they blow up the produce so we get big tomatoes and big apples and big peaches there but we're not getting the minerals and we're not getting the health we're not getting the taste um, that we need it, they look good um, uh, and and but it's a false stimulation there okay <clears throat> Is there any chemical difference between the Atlantic and the Pacific uh, Ocean water? No. Um, you can go anywhere on Earth, and this uh, balance in the soil or in the water remains the same. Now, what happens? Uh, extra things are constantly being washed into the ocean by rivers and streams all over the world there. And whatever's out of that balance quickly drops to the ocean floor. Um, so that you can take this uh, water out of the Pacific Ocean, you could take it out of the Atlantic Ocean, you could take it out of the Caribbean, uh, we could go to the Dead Sea, we could go to the Great Salt Lake, uh, and if we take the water, uh, it's going to be the same. Now, the amount of water compared to minerals is going to vary from the Atlantic Ocean to um, the Dead Sea. So there's, 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 there's more water in the Atlantic Ocean um, per cubic foot than there would be in the Dead Sea there. <clears throat> but the mineral content is going to remain exactly the same there. It's a good question. Uh, do we know about the rule that rocks play in the ground? Well, we know some things, but we, um, uh, when it comes to this Ellen White planting method, we still don't know all the reasons that it works. Now, our soil basically is made out of rocks. It's just rocks that have powdered and worn over the years. So, um, <clears throat> uh, but we don't know all the reasons for the rocks there. Okay, we want to take other uh, questions. One more was, when we use sea salt from the grocery store as a substitute for nitrogen. Sea salt from the grocery store. Oh, okay, can we use sea salt from the grocery store? Okay, you can go to the grocery store and buy different types of sea salt. Uh, one is called pure sea salt. Uh, it's pure white, and it's been purified, meaning that they have taken out the minerals that we want, and then they add aluminum to it so that it'll pour through your salt shaker easily. So it's been purified. Um, they've taken out what we want, and... Uh, it's pure white and it's pure poison. So don't use that in your garden. Um, and uh, don't use it yourself for that matter. Uh, but do, do get uh, the 
the ocean water that's been dehydrated with nothing added and nothing taken out. Now there are a number of different places that you can get this. Uh, for agriculture, I, I like the C90 best. It comes from a clean part of the ocean. Um, <clears throat> that's uh, Baja. That's a big desert, and um, there there are no uh, large cities. There's hardly even even any fishing villages through there. Twice a year in an estuary there, the water comes high enough that it overflows and goes into this estuary, and then in the desert sun, it quickly dries out. Now, then they harvest that, and with nothing added and nothing taken out, that's what you want. You can get um, um, sea salts from different parts of the world. Uh, over around France and Portugal, there are some uh, salts that come from that. You can get those in the health food store, and supposedly that's with nothing added, nothing taken out. Uh, those are usually pretty expensive, and I do not, uh, I don't use those because that comes from an expensive, it comes from a, a dirty part of the ocean. There are a lot of cities around there. Um, if you couldn't get anything else, then I suppose that would be a good substitute there. Some people have asked me about um, the Himalayan salt. Um, Himalayan salt has 84 different minerals in it there, and I don't use that because the Himalayan salts and some of the other salts from Utah and other uh, salt deposits on Earth, uh, they're actually coming from ancient seabeds, dried out seabeds. So yes, we're getting a lot of good minerals in it, but we're also getting the imbalances that drop to the ocean floor there. So if you can get the ocean water dehydrated, nothing added, nothing taken out, that's probably the best. If you can't get that, then maybe some of these other substitutes could work. But don't don't use that pure sea salt. That would be just plain pure poison there. Yes? Uh, you mentioned, mentioned the hydroponic. Yes. Um, would that have all the minerals in it? The, the, the tomatoes, for example. Yes. Let's talk about hydroponics and does it have all the minerals in it. Um, with hydroponics, my experience with hydroponics is um, that we're adding maybe um, 16, maybe as many as 20 minerals back in. Hey, we've got 92 that we want to get back in there. So uh, no, we don't, we don't have all the minerals with hydroponics. Another thing that I find with hydroponics is that people get all excited about it because they say, wow, this food tastes so good and it's so fresh. Well, if you went out to your backyard and picked a tomato or lettuce or whatever, obviously it's going to be very fresh, much fresher than what we're going to get in the grocery store that was picked a week ago and shipped to market there. And so they say, well, this is great. Well, when I come along and we test it with a refractometer and, uh, and with taste, uh, it is very deficient. It is very deficient there. Now, last year I did a lot of experimenting with hydroponics because, uh, particularly aeroponics, because it's the fastest way to grow uh, any plant. And um, so we tried to combine these different things with some differing, differing amounts of ocean water, thinking that maybe, because this is a fast way of growing things, that maybe we could make this food uh, good. I'll tell you that it absolutely failed. Yeah. So that's not the way God grows things. Uh, and so I've come to the conclusion that uh, God grows it in the soil, and there's good reasons for it. And, of course, there's life in the soil that we're not going to have in the hydroponics. So I've given up on hydroponics for now. Yes, ma'am? Uh, I use the same sea salt uh, in my kitchen. Uh, obviously, we need some salt for, you know, to make food taste good. But I'll tell you that... Um, because this salt might be better, it's still not a health food, okay? So just use it like you would a normal salt for, for seasoning. Don't, don't think that because it's, because it's better that we can use a lot of it. It'll, it'll kill you too out of balance there. Okay, pardon me? C, C90, S-E-A slash 90, C90. Uh, does anybody here have a source of C90? Do you have a source of C90? No. Okay. We'll, we'll find a source of C90 if we have to 
get information to you later. Yes, sir, you had a question. Yes, what is a nutrient drench? A nutrient drench, good question. Um, <clears throat> a nutrient drench is uh, when, when we put all these minerals out into the garden, we're going to see an increase in the energy in that garden right away. After that garden's been growing for a month or two, we'll see that energy go down and down there. The plants are using the minerals and whatever. What's happening, they're living off of the energy that those minerals are created. We say they're using nitrogen and calcium and so forth, and they are, but they're living off of that energy. The nutrient drench is putting minerals back in that make that energy go back up there. If you keep that energy at the maximum where it should be, you'll get pretty phenomenal growth there. Now, let's think about this a minute here. Um, all life is electrical. However, if the state wants to execute a man, they'll put a jolt of electricity through him that'll kill him. So too much, again, is a bad thing. It's, it's lethal. So we need it in balance, and we need it according to the plant that you need. Let's talk about uh, how you can make a nutrient drench. Uh, <clears throat> If you have a good compost that you've made or can purchase and uh, earthworm castings, if you will take some of that and put it in a bucket of water, mix it up, that's a nutrient drench right there. Now, that's, that's kind of a messy nutrient drench because we always have mud and what have you left in the, in the bucket there. It's good stuff. It'll keep your plants growing nicely. And the nutrient drenches that come from well, International Ag Lab or some other uh, fertilizer company, um, they're, they're, they're so much uh, cleaner and easier to use and easier to measure because we can't measure exactly what the nitrogen content and so forth is in compost from your backyard there. Another question? Yes, sir. Say that again. Oh. Yes, yes, okay. Um, uh, mulch does a wonderful thing for the soil. It also is the perfect place to grow earwigs, sawbugs, snails, slugs, um, mice. Um, and uh, in, in this little experimental garden that we did, um, one of those rows was a mulch row. Um, and, and uh, at the end of the year, I, I, I would total up what, you know, each, each week when we came into garden class, we'd pick everything that was ripe and then <clears throat> record it and send it all home with people. Um, at the end of the year, I was totaling up all of these things, and I was absolutely shocked at how little useful produce we got out of that mulch row. That mulch row looked wonderful all year round, all summer long, while the rest of the plants were uh, stressed with the heat, uh, sometimes 100 degree uh, Fahrenheit um, heat. And that row just looked wonderful. And so I was absolutely shocked at how little was actually there. So I went back and looked at it, and that's what was happening. Uh, we were growing the pests and those things that ate that produce and destroyed it faster than the produce was growing. So uh, I like what mulch does to the soil, um, but my purpose is to grow food for us to eat. Um, so I'm, I'm still working, I'm, I still need a solution to that. And uh, uh, there. Okay, let's take one more question and then I want to go. Yes, ma'am. What do you do if you have grubs in your soil? If you have grubs in your soil, I guess you get a mold to come eat them. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that, uh, there are several things you can do. It depends on the type of grub. It might be from um, Japanese beetles, and uh, so there are products that you can get that will kill the Japanese beetles. It's called BT, and you know the scientific name for that. Anyway, you go to the, you go to the nursery and say, I've got grubs. What do you have for that? And they'll sell you some little product that you can put out there. Not to use this, this is not a chemical. This is a disease, <clears throat> and and you can buy this, and it won't affect your animals or humans or whatever. Uh, it'll just affect those 
there. So it is a good uh, solution. Now, it's not a good solution when they combine that Bt, uh, genetically modify it into the plant. That's where we get all those problems. But if you just use that on the, on the soil, it's all right. All right, let's go on. We've got lots of things to cover here. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, and we, I really want to get out in the garden uh, this afternoon. Okay, uh, fencing, trellising, watering, planting. There, um, you, you, you will need, uh, if you grow this way, you're going to have food which the animals will absolutely uh, love. And so they'll get a taste of your garden. They'll bypass 10 of your neighbor's gardens to come eat yours. Um, so you're going to need fencing there. Uh, in one experiment, uh, this was on the Ray Hine and Son farm. I think this was uh, southern Illinois. Uh, on this farm, uh, they took some ocean water salts and they spread them in a square out in the middle of a pasture. And as the animals grazed across the pasture, uh, they eventually came to this square where the ocean water had been um, uh, put, uh, applied to that soil. When they came there, they stopped and they ate everything in that square. They ate the grass right down to the roots before they would go on. So the animals can tell the difference, and the animals will be able to tell the difference in your garden, too. Uh, so fence it, trellis it, water, um, take care of those things. Uh, deer fencing, there are many ways of fencing. One thing that I like is something called fickle fence, or there's Benner's fence from someplace in New York. Um, this is simply a, a very heavy plastic fence. And um, you can... Uh, <coughs> You, you can get it in seven and a half foot uh, tall rolls. You only want to put it at six feet tall. So take T posts and pound them in. Take an eight foot T post, pound it in uh, so that it's six foot high. Um, you can put these about 15 feet apart and then roll this fence out. Now it's much easier to put up than other fencing. Uh, it has advantages and disadvantages there. Uh, an advantage is that it's a lot less expensive uh, and uh, it's much easier to put out. Now, if it's seven and a half feet tall, and you're only putting it here, six feet, and when it comes to the ground, it's got one and a half feet that go out away from the garden. Um, now, this is a flexible fence, and so a deer, a skunk, um, an animal will come up to it, and he can get underneath it because it's flexible. It's not metal there. So he'll get his nose under, and he'll get into your garden and eat it anyway. So put it out coming out on the ground like this. The first year you might have to put some rocks or bricks or something along the edge of it there. But after that, the grass will grow through and the animal won't be able to get into it. Uh, often they will stand on it and try to get in and that confuses them. And the same thing will happen with a the deer there. So they won't be able to get in there. Uh, so it's easy to put up. Uh, you can see here there's a... Well, we're putting it up. Let me see if I've got another. Well, this is just how we put it in the ground here. You need a fence post pounder. Well, let's look at this one here. Uh, you can see here we've got a lady in a dress and sandals um, putting the fence out there. And um, um, so a, a disadvantage is that if fire gets anywhere close to it, it'll melt. An advantage is that you can take big kitchen shears and just cut that and you can patch it and keep right on going. So there are advantages and disadvantages. I also find that this lasts about 10 years and then the sun de degrades it and it begins to fall apart there. I have had some animal with very sharp teeth uh, chew through it. Now that doesn't happen very often, but I did have that happen uh, at least once there. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, let's not worry about that. Okay, gophers are a big thing. Um, do we, we have gophers here, do we? Groundhogs, okay. All right. Well, if we, if we have gophers, um, or we have rodents, let's say, that uh, will eat the roots of trees and will, uh, your garden, then you're gonna have to fence those um, out. Now, uh, a way of doing that is to take gopher fencing, which is, like hardware cloth here. This is 24 inches by 100 feet. And and we make a um, trench in the ground for gophers. 
uh, and you mm -hmm. want four to six inches of this above the ground and the rest below ground. Now what happens with gophers, they'll come through the ground. I'm not worried about moles, okay? Moles are looking for grubs, um, but the gophers are vegetarians. And so you can be out there in the garden and see a tomato plant shudder and disappear as the gopher is pulling it down, yes. Uh, and they'll do the same with, with other plants too. There. So in this case, we, we make a gopher fence. Now a gopher can easily go, um, you know, below this, this fence, and they do. But gophers uh, are looking for roots, and uh, so the roots are closer to the surface. Also, you know if you have gophers because they have these little volcanoes of dirt that they throw out every now and then. There. So the deeper they go, the more work they have to do and the less food they find. So they're along the surface there. Now when they nest, they'll go much deeper into the ground uh, there. <clears throat> um, anyway, so the, the gopher's coming through the ground. He hits this gopher fence. He's, his habit is that he'll come up, not down. And when he comes to the top of the ground, if, you're, if your fence is um, equal with the top of the ground here, he'll just walk across. Now he's trapped into your garden, so you don't want that. Have it uh, four to six inches above ground, and he will not climb that. Um, he's an, um, a ground animal, and he knows that if he climbs, that a hawk, um, yeah, some animal will get him <laughs> there. So anyway, you, you can do that. <clears throat> okay. What doesn't work well? Shooting, trapping, poisoning, deterrence with noise, light, smells, dogs and cats. Now, they all work some. Um, every year somebody will come to me in a garden class who maybe is new and say, oh, I got this wonderful thing. It's a little um, battery operated thing and it makes a little noise and every few seconds it puts out this little sound into the garden and it keeps the gophers away. And sure enough, it does. It keeps the gophers away for maybe a month or six weeks until the gopher realizes that that little is just a dinner bell. There's lots of food over here for him. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they, they, they have very keen sense of smell and especially if you do a greenhouse um, boy there's a you've got a greenhouse full of wonderful food for them and it's cold and barren outside so if they get into your greenhouse that's like a Hawaiian vacation for them there <laughs> okay trellising <clears throat> Uh, for trellising, I do like, uh, well, there are all kinds of things that we can do here, but I do like to use um, fencing that's more like deer fencing with big openings in it there. Mm -hmm. Now, fencing, we want to go right onto the ground, but when we're trellising, we want that up off the ground for about six inches or so. And again, we're using the T-posts, so let's use a six-foot fence, six-foot tall fence, and let's use eight-foot uh, T-posts. We pound them in the ground. Let's pound them in the ground there, and then stretch this fencing out. Uh, now, here you will need uh, a post every five feet. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, towards the end of the season, uh, you'll have lots of weight on that trellis, and we're going to get winds, especially towards as the seasons change. Now, when, when that happens... Um, That'll blow right over unless you have a good, strong support. So put the posts about five feet apart, uh, uh, um, apart there. Then I like to use uh, zip ties because they're plastic, and at the end of the season, you can just cut that off, take it out of the garden, take the posts out, and then you can rototill the whole thing again. There. <clears throat> okay. Um, this is talking about sprinkler systems here. And I, I like to use the T-tape. Here we are. Um, the tapes come in long rolls like that. And uh, you can get T-tape from uh, John Deere uh, Company. They have bought out the T-tape company, a T-tape company anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so you, it, it's simple, it's easy. You can get it so that there is an emitter every four inches, every six inches, every foot. And I like it for the garden every four inches. And you just put that down the middle of the row. Um, hook it up, and uh, if you put it on a timer, then, you know, if you're gone to camp meeting for a week or something, you come back and the garden is still going strong there. Yeah. Okay, let's go on here. Planting seedlings. Um, well, we use a transplant water. 
use that in the bottom of the of the uh, row. Most people, when they're most people when they are um, transplanting, they will transplant into relatively dry soil, and then um, they'll water the dickens out of the top. Put the water in the bottom of the hole. Make the hole. Put some water. Some particularly transplant water in the bottom of the hole. We talked about nutrient drenches. That would be very similar to a transplant formula. Uh, put that in the bottom of the hole and then use relatively dry dirt to push in back around um, that and you'll have better, far better results with that. <clears throat> okay, and this last thing here, it says dust the roots with a uh, 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 tablespoon of uh, jubilate, which is a microbe inoculant. I showed you different microbe inoculants there. So you'll, you'll have good success if you do that. Here we are just making a nutrient drench. Okay. Here's a little seven-year-old girl. We were working in a greenhouse. She and her dad were planting um, some broccoli and cabbage and Brussels sprouts and what have you. And uh, nice little plants in the greenhouse. And uh, we planted them and came back the next mor morning and half of them were gone. Um, mice had gotten in overnight and eaten them there. So let me see if I can find another picture of her. Here she is planting those. And what we did is to take uh, little styrofoam cups and uh, cut the bottom out of them and slip it over the plant. And that was enough to keep the, the uh, mice away from those plants and they matured just fine there. Uh, okay, this is a formula. Plants are growing but not producing anything. Here's the formula. Okay. Um, now, I want you to notice that this guy has a Coke in his hand, and that's not for him to drink. Uh, then he has some um, ammonia sitting on the table there, and um, um, uh, vinegar there. So, here's the formula. Uh, how to change a plant from vegetative growth, leaves and stems, to seeds and fruit. And <clears throat> Start with an empty uh, five-gallon bucket. Put in a pint of ammonia. That's a half a quart. Put in one quart of vinegar and a can of regular Coke or Pepsi. Now, you want that for sugar and the phosphoric acid there. And if you have it, then optional, put in a little ocean water. This will work without ocean water, too, though, uh, there. Now, uh, you see that little plant I've got in my hand there? There's a little fig tree. Um, if we're doing a fig tree or if we're doing a tomato plant, we can change them in a matter of about a week of, of uh, drenching those. If, you're, uh, if you've got a fruit tree and it's not producing, uh, the the wood that grows this year is going to make next year's fruit. So you want to treat that tree, but obviously we're not going to get fruit out of it this year. It's going to come next year there. But you can change that tree. This little uh, fig tree here is way too little uh, to have figs. Uh, in uh, Leviticus, we're told that we want to, um, uh, for the first three years, that we want to pick the fruit off the, off the fruit trees. Thank you. I'll pick the uh, fruit off and just drop it at the base of the tree. Let it recycle a little green fruit there. From the fourth year on, uh, well, at the fourth year, the crop was all um, an offering to the temple there. And then from the fifth year on, God says you may eat of that tree. And he says that if you do that, that he'll bless that, and that tree will do better. Now, what's happening here is that the, the growth is going into the tree Instead of making fruit, the growth is making, going into that tree, so the tree is stronger. It's making stronger branches and, and uh, leaves, and when that <clears throat> so that when that tree is mature, it will produce far more fruit than if we tried to force it too early there. Oh, I should tell you that that little fruit tree there um, actually put out a uh, about 30, it put out 30 fig, figs for me that year. Uh, in this particular class, uh, I drenched that tree and uh, showed what to do now. Now, a five-gallon bucket, this is enough material for a five-gallon bucket full of, of this stuff. 
Uh, and uh, that little tree probably took no more than about a quart, uh, maybe less. <clears throat> so anyway, I drenched that tree. And then somebody came in late to class, and they said, oh, I didn't see that. Can you do it again? And so we did it a second time. Then there's this Russian gal, and all of us shows up late. And she came in after class was over with her kids, and she said, oh, what would you do in class today? So I told her, and she said, well, can I see it? So that poor little tree got drenched three times that that uh, day. But it gave me 30, 30 uh, figs there. Now, that tree is damaged um, because we forced it uh, early. And, um, and I do this because it, with figs, you can tell very quickly. Uh, a week later, it had tiny little figs on it. Two weeks later, I bring it back to class because by that time, the figs are just big enough that people can see there. And then I'll give the, the, the tree away there. <clears throat> um, it, uh, anyway, this, this formula works, and, I, and it's in your handout. So you use it, and you'll get good results when you want to change things there. Okay, uh, Ellen White tree planting birth, the forestry method. Uh, May 2004, six sequoia trees were planted, same size, same time, same place. Um, let's look at the difference here. <clears throat> this is at three and a half years old. Um, and this is at three and a half years old. Um, huge difference. Yeah, one tree, we're giving it everything that it needs, and the other tree, we just put a hole and put it in the ground there. Okay, this is, well, can you tell which one is the Ellen White tree there? Yeah, this is at five years. Um, this is at less than five years, but I don't know what it is. Oh, no, it says five years. Oh, yeah, this is five years again. Okay. Okay, six-year-old there. Um, and look at the difference in trunk size here. Okay, one thing we want to do is put air down there in that hole. This is a planting hole there. And in this particular place, well, we're just mixing the, um, the the compost and the other stuff we're putting into that hole. You need a layer of rock, and we'll show that uh, on Sunday when we plant that tree. You also need a gopher protector uh, or rodent protector if you um, if that is a problem there. Now, um, this. Uh, gopher protector here is way too small. So cut off a piece of, of uh, this hardware cloth that is at least 9 feet, maybe 10 feet long, and that will just about fill that hole, um, that 3-foot hole, nicely. You also need to overlap it if you have, if you have this um, fencing and it, it, it buckles enough so that you have an inch there. That gopher will find that hole and you'll get in there. Now he's trapped inside, so you got to make sure that you you keep him out. There. Okay. Uh, in this case, the uh, deer fence wasn't up yet, so we put in a temporary deer fence. And uh, if you do that, um, the deer will come over and they'll push on that fence, and they'll get right over and eat the uh, tree anyway. So put in a couple of stakes so that he can't do that there. In this particular garden, this is one of our gardens there. Um, there, often, often. Um, well, in this this garden, one year we had a budget of zero, and um, so what I did is make a little list and ask people in the garden class if anybody would be willing to, um, you know, buy different plants or seeds or whatever. And it seemed like even the the poorest of the people in the class would at least get some seeds there. A side benefit that I didn't expect was that people took ownership and one of the guys in the class said well I'll take care of the melons and so he bought melon plants and planted them and he took good care of them this particular melon when it was ripe uh, we cut it open and towards the end of summer um, I lose control of the class it becomes a party and, uh, <laughs> and there's no more teaching there but uh, so we cut this melon open uh, when it was ripe and it was bright yellow uh, yeah, and he had bought a yellow watermelon. It was delicious, but it surprised us all. There. Okay, just some more things here. 
Okay, I want you to pay attention to the uh, tomato plant on the right. That is sun gold, and you can usually get that in most, most places. It's a little cherry tomato, and it is the sweetest tomato that I've been able to grow anywhere with BRICS readings up around 18. Now, if you can get a uh, BRICS reading on your tomatoes at um, 7 or greater, they will taste great. This was up around uh, 18 and was very, very good. The one on the left is an early girl tomato, and it's a fairly small tomato, but um, uh, but uh, uh, good flavor there. Uh, I had a little lady come to me, a uh, real sweet lady, uh, her name is Sobeda, and she's come to the garden class every year faithfully for the last eight, ten years. And so she came to me one, uh, one day, and she had this scrawny little... Um, squash plant that in a styrofoam cup and she said oh Lynn she said I grew this myself and I saved the seed and uh, she said could you plant this and I didn't say this out loud but what went through my mind is Sobeda we don't save seed from squash plants because they might have crossed with a cucumber or a melon and we get something that you just absolutely don't want um, besides that that little plant is so sick it's not going to make it there but I didn't t say that out loud. I took that little plant <coughs> and we planted it. We put the nutrient drenches on it. We put the uh, transplant formula on it and so forth. You know that little plant took over the lower end of the garden. And here's one of the squash. They were absolutely delicious. It's a Kubota squash. Anybody know what that is? Uh, uh, Armenian. Well, that's an Armenian cucumber. It's actually a melon. It actually is a melon. Uh, belongs to the melon family, but it's an Armenian cucumber, and they are so prolific. How about this? You know what that is? Kohlrabi, yes. Um, and ladies, uh, if you if you like beets, but you know you, you you make a a dish for potluck, and if you put any beets in it, it just messes everything up, doesn't it? There. So if you like the beets and you want one that is not going to bleed all over everything, get that one that's on the top. It's called a gourmet beet and it, and it's kind of a yellow or some of them are pink some of them are yellow or even white it has good um, beet flavor and it will not run so you can you can um, you can have good beets there okay and this is what we do in our garden uh, we pick everything put it out on a, on a table and we tie that garden now at, when we first started we tied that by um, making sure that at least 20% went up to um, community services the next morning and they would give everything away. Often, uh, way more than 50% of, of the produce in that garden actually went to tithe. Uh, yes, uh, now in later years we changed how we tithe um, because people coming through the line at community service, um, they had no idea where it came from, they were just glad to get produce there. So we took so we had people, um, I would tell people that if they knew anybody in their neighborhood who was sick, maybe somebody who had cancer and who needed this food because it's healing, it's so much more healing than the best food you can get in the grocery store. Okay, now, w my wife and I ran chip programs for a lot of years, and we did a lot of good there. But you can do so much better if you, if you have this type of high-quality produce where it's fully mineralized there. So I want people to tithe, either to sick people or this little lady, Sobadia, that uh, I mentioned. She came to me one day and she said, oh, she said, I have this neighbor and um, uh, she's a mom that has been abused and she had to run with uh, nothing but her children to get away from um, spousal abuse. Uh, and she has absolutely nothing. I said, so Beta, you take as much food as you can, as you think that lady can possibly use in a week, and you give it to her there. So that was our way of tithing in that case, too, there. So anybody who needed it. Now, will it make more difference if you give that food away personally, if you say, I grew this myself, um, or I helped grow it, uh, and I know that it's far superior to anything you can get in the grocery store as far as healing, as far as health. Um, it means far more to those people. It's far better outreach. It's a, it's a better way of, of uh, tithing there. Okay, I want to...
Lay this down for a minute. This is a refractometer. <clears throat> um, it's, used in, it's used in medicine. It's used in agriculture. And what we're going to do is to uh, put a drop of the juice. Uh, we're going to start with tomatoes here. I'm going to put a drop of the juice here. And then I'm going to have somebody look through it this way and read what's in there. What they're looking at will be a round circle. Part of it's blue and part of it's white. There are numbers along the side. Where the blue and the white come together, um, that is the reading for that particular produce. So I'm going to need some volunteers um, on that. You, yes, come on up. Here, I'll have you hold that. All right, the first thing we're going to bricks here is a an organic tomato. All right, so we just need a, a bit of the juice, and let's put it here. Okay, that's enough. Okay, now look through that, and you can adjust the eyepiece. What is it? Four. four. Okay, so we've got a reading of four. Let me double check it. Okay. 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 Uh, that's an organic tomato. Now, uh, what I said a few minutes ago, we need a, a bricks reading of seven or greater uh, to have a good tasting tomato there. So. Um, yeah, cut this one for me. Okay, now we're going to take a just a regular tomato from the grocery store. Yeah, just just so we can get some juice there. And let's see, I had um, I had um, okay. Yeah, we need to wipe that. Okay, uh, Robert, read this one for us. Tell us what it is. Okay, this is this is just the regular tomato, not the organic. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Yes. Same thing. So here we have. Uh, a regular tomato and the organic, and we pay, what, three times more for the organic than the other. There, let's wipe this off again. Take the lid up, yeah. And then there, too. This is organic, and this... Uh, okay, so now we're going to take a organic... Um, 
Yeah, cut that and put a piece of that on for Robert. That's good. Let's do this. Okay. Yep, that's enough. That's enough. And this is an organic cherry tomato. Cherries usually have a higher um, bricks reading. Yeah. So if you want the sweetest tomatoes. 7.5. 7.5. That's good. That's very good. 7.5. Okay. Let's try. Uh, no, that's good, Robert. Let's, let's do the non-organic now. Okay. Okay. Now we had a uh, question here because this says non-GMO. Non yeah, certified non-GMO. I'll tell you that um, for the tomatoes that are in a grocery store, they are not genetically modified. The genetically modified tomatoes we've had so far have failed, and so there are none that I know of anyway that are on the market. Um, none, no genetically modified. They may be sprayed like crazy, but. They're not, not genetically modified. An eight? Yes. An eight. Okay. All right. Praise the Lord. Costco. <laughs> okay. If you can't grow your own. Okay. So what happened here? We had the non-organic come in at eight. Wow. And we had the uh, organic come in at seven. Seven point. Eight. This, one, this one is eight, but yeah. this previous one was 7.5. 7. 7. 7. Okay. Yes. So what's happening is that we are paying way higher for the organic produce, uh, and we're not getting, as far as food value, we're not getting it. Now, you may be, it may be a good thing to go organic to eliminate the, the poisons that we put on it, but people are often shocked at, at the difference here. What's that? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, well, G Gabriel, uh, Gabriel just asked me, um, I, I think I've got three or four of those with me. Those are those little instruments. Now, you don't need one of these instruments to tell you whether food is good or not. Your tongue will tell you that. But, yes. Um, yes. But uh, if you want one, I think I bought three or four with me. I can't bring very much in an airplane with me there. That particular instrument uh, retails for $119. While I'm here, if you want it, it's $90 if you'll see me there. Pardon me? Yeah, what's the difference between U.S. and 1.5? Okay. Yeah, that's U.S. That makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go on to something else. Yeah. Um, either one. Uh, okay. Okay, somebody else want to volunteer to read this thing? I have another volunteer? Come on up. Come on up. What's your first name? Okay. 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 All right. Jenny's going to read this one. This was a peach. Okay. A 12. Okay. Um, uh, well, uh, look, in your, look in your handout under the BRICS readings and, and look at peach and see what that should be. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to get a better part of that? Well, it's it's the yeah. 
Looking for some juice on this one. Alrighty. Not much there. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay, Paul, what's that one read? Twenty-one. Okay, for the nectarine. That's good. That's good. Peaches, uh, 18. And, and where were we on the reading? This one was 12. This one was 12. So for peaches, we were, yeah, we were between average and good um, there. But 18 would be excellent. And, uh, and you can get up to 18. You can, you can make your peaches go up that high and even higher there. And then, Paul, what did we have? 21. 21. I uh, don't know if we have a nectarine on here. Similar to a peach, but at 21, we're way above the uh, um, excellent range, so that would be a good one there. Okay, now we're going to do an orange. Um, that was a clementine orange, and for oranges, we've got, well, let's see what Paul says. What does it read? 12. Okay. So again, we're between uh, average and good there. Um, okay. How about, yeah. Yeah, let's do a grape for Jenny. Are these ones organic or just? Yeah, no, they're just, just, just regular. Uh, grapes. Okay. We have, yes. Okay. Let's see what the grape is, Jenny. 21, great, that's good. So for a grape, uh, 20 would be excellent, and that's great. Okay, now what are we measuring? Paul asked me what we were measuring, and thank you, Jenny. Uh, <clears throat> uh, what we're measuring is the um, nutrient density uh, in the juices there. And... Um, and uh, part of that is uh, it actually is the sh are the sugars that that plant makes. Now those are the good sugars. Those are the sugars that our body needs to run off of for energy. So uh, that's a good thing. There. Okay. Thank you, Paul. I think that's all we'll do okay. here. Thank you. For the yes. Thank you. Okay, um, let's go back to the handouts here. just take these as they come up here. <clears throat> if you go to one that looks like this, has a diagram of roots on the top <clears throat> there, each one of those lines is one foot deep in the soil. And this often shocks people <clears throat> because when we rototill, we usually are rototilling at about six and three quarter inches deep. Um, if, we <clears throat> if we double dig, we might be down uh, 20, 24 inches there. 
Uh, but look, even our shallow rooted plants go deeper than our uh, rototilling. And then if you look over in the far right, uh, look at that tomato. Tomato root can easily go 10 feet deep in the ground um, if it's not stopped by solid rock or a layer of clay that it can't get through or dry ground, something like that. It can easily go 10 feet deep in the ground. Now, uh, you can understand why we can't get 100 pounds of tomatoes off of somebody uh, growing a tomato in a pot on the back porch there. Uh, it needs far more uh, soil there. And even, <clears throat> even what we call shallow-rooted plants, broccoli, cabbage, um, cauliflower, celery, and so forth, are two feet deep. Uh, Ellen White tells us to dig deeply and to dig often. And so uh, uh, this, this just shows you the, the difference there. When we dig, even uh, uh, preparing what we call an Ellen White planting hole, we're only going down about three feet in most cases. And, <clears throat> uh, and our peppers, green beans, potatoes, summer squash, sweet corn, they're all down that deep there. So um, it, it, this is pretty important that we have a deep digging there. Uh, <clears throat> when we get out, while I'm on this page, I'm going to go down to the next thing here. What size should I make my soil beds? I'm taking this from mint lighters there. Uh, standard mint lighter bed is 30 feet long. Now you can make it any length that you want there. Each bed, now we, we do that because so we have some standard to go by and says how much to put on per row and so forth there. But <clears throat> each bed holds two rows of plants at the base of two ridges of soil. And um, if you look in the lower uh, left hand corner, you'll see those two ridges of soil. You see that they're about 18 inches wide. Where the flat part is in the middle is only about 12 inches across there. And then you want to plant a, a, um, a, um, a line of plants along, uh, right along that ridge on either side. Now, for the irrigation, you run your T-tape or your irrigation right down through the middle of that. If you're putting fertilizer in by hand, then you put the fertilizer in the middle there and uh, water it in. The little ridges on either side will keep the fertilizer there and keep the water there and will do a good job for you as far as weed control and containing everything. If we didn't have that and we watered, we'd lose the fertilizer and the water and it would just run off um, there. So th th this makes good sense uh, to do that. Also, he liked to use... <coughs> um, he liked to use plants, uh, um, rows that were five feet on center. So that would give you, in this case, that would give you about three and a half feet, you look in the center there, of walkway, and then 18 inches uh, on the row, um, and, and we just repeat that throughout the garden. Uh, if you're growing something big like tomatoes, then of course that's just a single row. We wouldn't put a double row in there. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, most things we can do uh, with a double row, even things like cabbage and broccoli, we can we can um, kind of do a zigzag um, um, pattern there. So, for instance, broccoli you want about 14 inches apart. So you just make a little stick that's 14 inches long, and um, and then measure it. You you put one plant here, measure it across the aisle and make one there and it just goes zigzag back and forth through the whole garden there. What will happen is that those plants will become crowded but one plant will lean this way into the row and the other plant will lean that way into the row, um, into the walking area and you'll have enough room for those there. If you have the room, if you have the room, uh, I really like to put these plant, these rows at least six feet apart um, because it'll it's going to get crowded uh, towards the end of the season <clears throat> there. And if you're growing something like uh, pumpkins or watermelons or whatever, they're going to sprawl all over the place. So in that case, you might want the your rows to be ten feet apart um, because you need plenty of room for the, those things to sprawl there. Okay.
Okay, there is a sheet that says how to use our directions for ocean salts or seawater. So directions for ocean salt or seawater. <clears throat> it says dilute one ounce of unrefined sea solids with two and a half gallons of fresh water. Or if you happen to go to the ocean and bring back a bucket of water, uh, dilute that one part of ocean water to ten parts of fresh water. Now either of those two are going to give you the same dilution there. When you dilute that, that much, what you will find, what you will find is if you taste that water, you will barely taste the salt. Just barely taste the salt there. And that's, that's the right amount that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> now then it says use this diluted water in a thousand square foot garden four to six times per growing season. I want you to write on yours that I want you to use this diluted water on one 30 foot row. Okay? One 30 foot row. For this part of the country, this part of the world, uh, one 30 foot row can take that. Now, uh, so we're, we're making this actually six times stronger than what the recipe says here. Because this recipe goes out to people um, all over the world, including uh, desert areas um, where we can't use, because in desert areas we often have very high salts in the water and in the ground. And so we have to be very careful with this. For you, uh, one do this on one 30-foot row, and you could use this four to six times during the growing season. You could use it, <clears throat> uh, use it uh, right after the plant flowers. Uh, uh, right up until uh, till, uh, frost there. Now, then the winter rains and snows are going to come, and this is going to wash it out of the ground. It will quickly wash the salt out of the ground uh, and and the, the uh, boron. Uh, those are the two things that would become toxic in our soil if we didn't have enough uh, rain. <clears throat> Let's go down here to peach leaf curl. Uh, you drench the leaves and stems and allow the mixture to drop on the ground for roots. Uh, and you repeat this after one week. You want to do it two times, at least two times. <clears throat> now, uh, when I first um, discovered this, I had a little peach tree in my backyard that got peach leaf curl. Now, peach leaf curl will kill a tree um, if it's not taken care of it, maybe three or four years, but it'll kill that tree. And if you know what peach leaf curl looks like, it's a little, um, it's an uncontrolled growth of cells. Uh, in humans, we call that cancer. We don't call this peach leaf cancer. We just call it peach leaf curl. But it's an uncontrolled growth of cells there. Now, um, uh, so I had this peach tree that was pretty sick. Uh, on cold, wet springs, this is more prevalent, more of a problem there. So I had been reading about this, so I mixed up a batch of ocean water. Then we didn't have the ocean water salts. I just took the ocean water and, and mixed it up. And I drenched that tree, which means I just went out in the backyard. And the tree was probably, I don't know, 10 feet tall or so by that time. And I just threw that water. I just took a cup and I threw that water all over that tree, let it fall all over the leaves. And then, of course, plenty of it fell to the ground. I did that two weeks in a row, two Sundays in a row there. And... <clears throat> Interesting thing happened. All of those leaves with the peach leaf curl turned black. They died. <clears throat> um, the healthy leaves, it did not affect them. And all of the new leaves that came out were very healthy and, uh, and had no peach leaf curl on it. And I thought, oh, wow, that works. But I got the biggest surprise when those peaches began to ripen because they were absolutely the most delicious peaches I had ever eaten in my life. Now, the next year, that little tree didn't have any peach leaf curl, so I didn't put any ocean water salt on it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and when the peaches began to get ripe, I would go out and try to find the ripest one, and, you know, I'm a little impatient, want to see what they taste like there. And they were good. I would have been uh, pleased if I'd bought a peach like that in the grocery store. However, it did not have that intense flavor that I had the year before. So I quickly went in and made a batch of this ocean water out and drenched that tree. It didn't work. You have to get those minerals 
to the fruit while it's forming. So right after the plant flowers and right after your trees flower, you want to start putting this on there. Now what happens if you get too much salt? Well, well of course we could kill things there. <clears throat> Uh, what happens is that if we get too much salt, the salt draws the water out of the plant. And so if we get too much, the plant can be sitting in water but dying of thirst there. So if you see that, if your plant is sitting in water, or in wet soil, I should say, but is wilting, then uh, chances are you have too much salt and just get out there and overwater it, leach out that extra salt there. Probably won't happen at these rates, but if it does happen, then you know what to do <clears throat> there. Now with sick, uh, sick plants, for instance, six trees, I will double the dose. In, in, uh, instead of using one ounce of um, unrefined sea solid, I would use two ounces to two and a half gallons. Now what's the worst I can do? Kill that tree? Kill that plant? It's going to die anyway if I don't. So, uh, yes. So I will. I will often up the dose on a sick plant, whether it's a tomato plant or uh, a tree. There. Or, yes, I would just double the amount of salt per water. There. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there. Okay. Let me put this down. Okay, and here's that formula. If you look at this, it says formula on the top there. And how to change a plant from vegetative growth, leaves and stems, to seed and fruit production. And that's what I just showed you a few minutes ago on the slide. So we start with an empty five-gallon bucket. We put in a pint of ammonia, a quart of vinegar, one can of Coke, regular, you, because you want the sugar and the phosphoric acid. And optional, if you have some uh, ocean water, put in a quart or a pinch of the ocean salt. Uh, it'll work with or without it, but it would help if you had that. Uh, and you will change that tree. Now, because of what goes into Coke and Pepsi, uh, I changed that uh, formula a little bit here. Instead of putting in the Coke or the Pepsi, if you would put in uh, about an ounce of soft rock phosphate, uh, and about an ounce of, um, of um, molasses, just uh, inexpensive molasses that you buy in a grocery store. So what you're doing there is you're providing the, the uh, sugars for that plant and you're providing the phosphoric acid. And it'll work just as well and you don't have the, um, the things that they put into <clears throat> Yes. Okay, use, use an ounce each of um, soft rock phosphate, okay, soft rock phosphate, yeah, just soft rock phosphate, okay, and you probably can buy that in the nursery even in small amounts there. Um, so an ounce each of the uh, soft rock phosphate and molasses, okay, yeah, there. <clears throat> Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. The question is, can we use CalFOS instead of uh, soft rock phosphate? CalFOS and soft rock phosphate are identical. It's the same thing. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. CalFOS is um, Cal hyphen Phos for calcium phosphate. Um, and that's what we want <clears throat> there. Okay. Um, I would... Um, I would like to change gears now and... Um, Go down into the garden and let's, uh, I, I need somebody to go over and get the tomato plants that are sitting out front there. Not, not these. Now these are for sale. What's the price on these? What are they? $10 a plant. Okay, $10 a plant. And there's several varieties over there. Um, how many plants? Okay, about 20 there now. We're not going to plant these here. We are going to plant these there just to demonstrate. 
there. Um, what's that? Uh, okay. Okay, maybe we should take one just for comparison there. Okay. <clears throat> This is copper sulfate. And remember, we needed just a very little bit of this according to our uh, soil test. But we needed uh, all this blue like that. And uh, so we needed two tablespoons. We needed. Uh, so anyway, let's put this in here. Yeah, we're going to measure out other things that we need. Let's go to. When you're given when you're given measurements and they say an ounce of this, a pound of that, remember that sixteen ounces is a pound. Okay? So just use your dry measuring cup. For most of us, it's a lot easier doing that than it is to try to measure that one. Really. Uh, 16 ounces uh, is going to be one pound. Magnesium in it. This soil is short of magnesium. down these measurements because they're, they're not going to fly even though they're not going to fly even though they're not going to fly even though they're not going to Thank you. 
Magnesium sulfate is just Epsom salt. That's all it is. Magnesium level was down. So, Borax 20 mule team, you get at the Sobeys grocery store in the laundry department. <laughs> What's that for, Boron? Yeah. <laughs> Gotta wash the place. <coughs> Remember, this is boron. Too much is toxic. So, more is not better with this particular We have no bubble. Very important nutrient, but we don't have a lot of Can you speak louder? Yes, a very important nutrient is boron, but we don't want it out of balance. This is college stuff. Nutrients in the soil, and some are just trace minerals. So some we want very little bit, and using a you know, an ounce or so. Of the Does the color of the soil tell us something? Like, is it important or not? Um, um, I want to tell you if I need to you. What, what happens if you can't get everything? that's in the list, okay? Um, get what you can, put that in, uh, and you're, you're making good progress. Um, last week I had some people in uh, New Mexico call me, and I had a complete list for them, and exactly what they needed in that soil. But these particular people were New Agers, and they consulted their the spirit or world? gods or whatever, I don't know what, how they did it, but <laughs> they decided that some of those things weren't necessary, So, but some of the things they did want. So through their divining, they told me what they wanted and what they didn't want. I put the right amounts in, there. they would have gotten better, they will get better results if they would put the whole mix in, but doing what they're doing, they're going to get at least partial results there. They're going to get better results than they would otherwise. And they also use the nutrient drenches, which are going to put into that plant what it needs um, uh, in a liquid form besides. But whatever you can get, put it in. Um, sometimes, sometimes you can go back. Sometimes you can go back and put in something watered in from the top or something. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 
Okay, remember we're down on zinc, so this is our zinc. Um, it would be, at home I use a little um, ounce measuring thing so I can measure out a little more exactly. But this is close enough. We can, we can do this. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, manganese also is a trace mineral, uh, but we actually needed more of the manganese. It was way, way down. Remember that that's the mineral that brings the spark of life into the, into the sea. Um, and that's the one that without it, we won't get good fruit production or seed production. So this one is important. a little more of this than you did zinc, and more of it than you did uh, boron. Magnesium is one of the major things we're putting in, and uh, manganese is a trace mineral. from, or if you were to get it from International Ag Lab, uh, it would come all pre-mixed, and so when you get it, it'll come in a regular box, uh, and then we broadcast it, and uh, uh, we broadcast it, and uh, dig it in, and it's so much, so much easier than that. Let's take that bucket again, and let's get the half of it. It's an international ag lab, but unless you can unless you can get your soil sample to the United States, uh, send it from the United States, and unless you can go then down there to pick up this stuff, um, I, I don't have a source locally. So maybe we'll be able to. Find local sources. Mm -hmm. so we can, we can mm -hmm. yeah, we'll, we'll try. 
Okay, uh, I like to divide this in about, about in half, and then uh, I want that um, distributed down. This is a 60 foot row, so we want to put it down there, and we want to come back on this side. This row, these are the as evenly right as we can, and I'll start out here. This is what, this is what we're going to do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. the child. I'm just probably going to be doing the same thing. All uh, right. Yeah, but let's do, let's do this. What, what I want to do is I don't want to run out, see. So I'll come in, and you see I've got a line of it here and a line of it there. Now, you see it comes in all different sizes and powders and what have you. So you can't put it through a fertilizer spreader. But then we'll come back in and we'll fill in these areas like that. And then we'll run the rototiller uh, or dig it in by hand and it'll be just fine. It'll work. It'll be mixed in just fine. Work itself out. <laughs> so, do, do I have a volunteer who's willing to get dirty? Right here. Okay. <laughs> Take your cover off. <laughs> spread that. Okay, I'll lay that in. It's okay yeah. that you don't use a glove. Concentration doesn't bother yes. you. Yes. Uh, okay, we got a question here. So what about using gloves? Uh, you can use gloves if you want. Listen, um, um, there's nothing in here that would hurt me uh, as long as I don't eat it. Okay. Now we've got some good soil here uh, that'll produce good food, but I wouldn't eat the soil. <laughs> so. It, it, it won't hurt you. You use gloves if you're more comfortable with that. <laughs> 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 Okay, for the sake of saving time, let's start with this one. Okay, we got a question here I don't want to answer. Uh, I don't have a garden this big, so what do I do? Well, we, just, we do the math and we just do the yeah, So we'll send you the right amount or we'll find out somebody who can Now, you have to go out and buy all of these things individually. Uh, it's it's going to get expensive. And for most people, it's far less expensive to Double digging. Came through here and rototilled it. Rototiller goes, there's the rototiller. And the rototiller will go maybe that deep. Seven um, inches. Seven inches maybe. There. And, uh, and then we've got a flower down there. Flower down there. So, what I did here is I came in and dug this. If you, have, if you have a wheelbarrow, the best thing to do is uh, 
thing to do, if you have a wheelbarrow, is to take this soil that you dig out of here and put it into that hole. I just put it on the side here. Okay? But this is what we want to do. We put it over here. So for now, that's our wheelbarrow. Uh, that's the soil. That's the soil that came out of here. Okay. So then I went down here as deep as I could go, and I couldn't go very deep. Uh, so I actually took the crowbar and loosened this so we could go down deeper here. Now this is a good place if you have. You have uh, homemade compost because homemade compost is not going to be hot enough to kill the pathogens and the weed seeds. Oh, and an earthworm. So that's good. That's a good sign. Incidentally, mm -hmm. um, some places in the tropics, difficult to grow earthworms because the calcium is so low. Mm -hmm. and calcium yeah, mm -hmm. Okay, so that's double dug now. Now, uh, rather than putting that soil back, we want to go to the next area here. And we'll put it on top right there. Spent it. Yeah. Mm. Subsoil to remain on the bottom. You make, if you take that subsoil and you bring it to the top, you will make your garden much more difficult. So leave the subsoil on the bottom. Often it's even a different color. This is not a different color. Okay. And we have a rake here. Uh, we make that grow and we make the, um, the 
little dikes on either side, and then the center is flat in here. The uh, T tape, the irrigation tape goes right down to the middle mm -hmm. there. And uh, we're on a slope here, so we may have to make this in a little. We may have to make this so that this is a little uh, and again, right? terrace, and then we make, make a dam and do the next terrace down here. But uh, when we, let's say that this garden had been planted a couple of weeks, and we've got a bunch of weeds coming up, and so we can run the road through the middle here, or a wheel hole, or a wheel hole, and we can pick that out, that's pretty fast. And then, when we come to these planks here, the dams, we go through with a rake, we just push that out of the way. Okay. Uh, so we push these dikes down like this. Mm -hmm. All the little weeds growing in that are going to die. And if we come back in a half hour or so, they're dead. And we just wake that up again and remake the dikes. Mm -hmm. So that's a very simple way of keeping the uh, of, of weeding and of handling that. So you can get um, between the two rows, because we're going to have two rows, one here and one here. There, so you can get between the two rows as far as, as weeding goes. Are the rows staggered or right beside each other? Uh, these are two rows. One, one will be right here. No, I mean the seeds. Right Sorry, the seeds. Yeah, the seeds are going to be zigzag, or they're going to be. It depends on what we're growing. If, I, if I'm not, if I have uh, broccoli. I want it here, and here, and here, okay. and here. If I've got carrots, I want a row here and a row here. So anything small, it's just a double row here. Including lettuce is the I want to pursue this a little further with the hula hole. Because if you get a hula hole that is a wheel hole, it just means that they've got a big wheel on the front of it and handlebars. And uh, then the soil will go behind. As far, fast as you can walk or run through that garden, you can weed it. All right? So, for me, it doesn't make sense for me to try to get the rototiller up and start it out. Uh, start it up because um, by the time I would check the oil and gas in the rototiller, I would have the whole garden done. Uh, now, for a small yard, maybe it's not. So if you have a big garden or a small farm, that's a very useful tool. Uh, at Weimar, there is a man that makes some. That's a very good one. That's one I've ever seen. And it's $250 U.S. plus the shipping to you. Uh, and then that includes one tool. Uh, and for extra tools that you might want to put on the back, there's an extra $50 for each tool. Locally, you can get a wheel hole at Lee Valley Tools. 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 I encourage you to go in and look at the wheel hole. But if you're handy with a welder, you can make them from a trip to the junkyard and about $5. Okay. Okay. Oh, 
the pile back on. And what we're going to do is plant potatoes down that row. And we're just going to cover it up. And we've actually got about six feet between the rows. Maybe a little bit more than that. We're going to take these stressed out tomato plants here. And we're going to plant them right down this row here. And see if we get some, we'll get some produce off of them. Uh, T-tape has to do with irrigation. That's an irrigation tape. So whatever irrigation tape you have, and you get that from the John Deere tractor. Maybe your local You can go to TF tractor supply stores, TSC, and co-op, farmer co-op stores. You can get It's basically like hose that's just flat. It looks like it looks like tape. It's got a little one pinprick every so often. Sometimes it's four foot, sometimes uh, four inches, sometimes twelve inches. Um, Six inches, it becomes a variety. You should always lay that up. Yes, now, you'll have little holes, and the holes always go on the top. It's engineered so that if water is going through that, if there's a particle of sand or dirt in there, uh, it won't get up and fly. So you can even bury it in the ground, but you always want those holes to be uh, I would put it, I put it on usually about this. You're not doing it today. Gord, need the potatoes, the box of potatoes. Okay, and you're going to put those potatoes about 12 inches. That's a milestone. Okay. 12 18 inches is probably good. Okay. 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 Do we have a volunteer to buy potatoes? Any volunteers for potatoes? Volunteers. Oh, woman, needs help. Come, Susan. I did my own already. Can you just get him put it down on his wheels? So how do you do it? Just throw it there? Just throw it there. Too far. Too far. You got to get sprout out there. Oh, that's Here, have it. Take this. Put it there. Come, come. Help me here. Oops. Put it there. Put it there. You go further, sir, so she can. All right. Right over here. Dan Petito coming to you. You can go ahead and put it right down. You don't have to throw it. Put it down. Put it down. Get some volunteers for planting tomatoes right here. Right here. No. I have Attention! Can I get the people who are planting on this side? And uh, if you're not planting, step back. So that you know, yeah, need to the camera. Oh, sorry. This side, this side. All right. 
take this on the yeah. 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 And this is our three plants. So we can do that. You want any water in that? Do we want water? Do we have water? We need water. Okay, there's water. For demonstration purposes. Okay, now this little plant will do much better. Relatively dry dirt. Okay. This plant will do better. Than if we water it out. And just a refresher for what you just put on the on the on the roof. This is pre plant. Called again? Uh, pre plant, uh, transplant, excuse me, transplant. Transplant and not. Yeah, transplant and not doing this one again. So, we'll go ahead and do the next one. Okay. Transplant and not doing this one now we can put this on the bottom of the hole. Basically, we need about a tablespoon of this. We don't have enough of this. Because, uh, Go ahead and take that out. Um, we're coming with one right now. Mama, you're trying again. Now, Ellen White talks about not damaging even a little feeder root here, but when we have uh, root bound, what happens? Now, how do we bonsai plants? We, we tie their roots. And this plant's roots have been tied by itself. So I break that up just a little bit. Beyond that, I don't want to break that up. So I just put that in the bottom. Put it as deep as we can. Okay. Now put the guy around. Yeah, that's it. I also like to think Some people like take the lower leaves off, but this one I certainly want to put this in. Okay, remember that this plant is number three. <laughs> talk about how to prune these plants. Okay, this is an indeterminate plant, which means that it's going to put out, uh, it's going to put out new branches like this. And you'll see that where we have a leaf coming out like this, then this little branch comes in here, comes right out there. So I want to take, take that off. I want to take this off. Take this one off over here. Take off the new branches? I'm taking off because this is making another head like this. Okay, so I want to take these off here uh, and tell them up to here, and then I want it to. So you don't want the head? Uh, not that low. Not that low. It gets a little higher. Okay. No. Okay, so let's plant this one. That's a pretty one. Do we have um, inoculant in it? We don't. Yeah. Uh, did I put it in that hole? No, not yet. Not at all. Okay. What is that, sir? Inoculant. Not to shock the plant and transplant it from one environment to the other. Not paying attention to Okay. I'll put some more. He was planting potatoes. Oh, yeah. yeah. sorry. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Good Thank you. Thank you. No, I didn't know. He told me. So I just. <laughs> don't do that. It's causing trouble. Oh, no. <laughs> well, let me get your attention a minute. <laughs> When you, uh, when we um, are doing construction work and we want to compact soil, we, you know, we have the tractors in there and whatever, 
then we put water on it, and we go over it again. Now, in your garden, if you do that, uh, if we're doing this, resist the temptation to mix that up with your hand, because what we're doing is compacting that and making it harder. So go ahead and put that in the ground now. Okay, now we want to push in the drier dirt around it. Just go ahead and push that in. There. And that's not too much uh, water for that little plant. That's just fine. There. Okay. So should all the other plants have had the same the, amount? All the other plants should have had more water. We just didn't have it, so we, so we did what we could there. And we're going to obviously run out of, of um, transplant inoculant. There. I want to save a little bit of that for Sunday morning for that tree um, there. Okay, um, anybody else want to plant? Just go ahead and plant, sure. and then we'll be through why here. Did, for why did you take the leaves that were touching the ground? Uh, why do we take those off? Because, that, because that's going to get uh, diseased and wet, and we just take it off. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. 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 Let's run the tiller again. Do you want to run? Don't worry. After you're gonna have to. You don't want to run potatoes in that aisle. If you do, I'm gonna ask for help. I'm gonna be pushing half of each way, right? So whatever. Okay, we're gonna be pushing. I, I normally wouldn't do that myself because it, because I wouldn't have dirt to heal on it, right? Because I like to heal my potatoes, and so that this, that would let me. So, we, so it's, it's not necessarily the best. That's all I'm saying. But, but we'd have to come back here to get dirt to fill it. Exactly. Okay. All right. What we're going to do is uh, put potatoes in this row too, and then the tiller will go right down through the middle and throw dirt on the other side. Anybody want to plant potatoes?
Just, just for your information, at, I, at home when I plant potatoes, I would never plant potatoes this way. When I plant potatoes, I use a tractor, so you use different tools. So I would use a, a, a potato hiller, which basically is just a plate, a disc. That's at around 30 degrees or so. Run down the row and it pushes it, the soil off to one side. And I actually go the opposite direction, push the soil off the other side. And I plant my potatoes and then I'll take on, I'll push the, hill, the dirt back on one side and leave it and let the plant grow. And then, after the plant starts to leave and come up above, above the soil, high enough that my tractor is not going to get it, then I come back on the opposite side and, and cover it again. It just it keeps the, the potatoes under the ground. If your potatoes touch sunlight and they turn green, they're poisonous. So, so um, n never eat green potatoes and make sure your potatoes are covered. But you can plant green potatoes. You can plant them though, but just don't eat them. <laughs> so, is that when they become nightshade? I'm not sure the chemistry is not in the term for us. Attention, please. Okay, if I can get your attention. Thank you, this was great. We gotta quit because it's lunchtime. Um, and uh, somebody did ask me, you see a tomato plant there. Uh, if you plant this way deep in the ground, what will happen is the roots will come out all along this stem. So you want to plant them deep. Now, almost everything else you want to plant at about the same level that it was growing. The tomatoes are an exception, you want to plant them. Thank you much. And, you can see the fuzzy little hairs on the bottom here. Yeah. Those are the roots. And, and just as an aside, sometimes you take a whole tray of tomato plants and one falls over and snaps off at the root. Nine times out of ten, if you plant that snap off in the ground, water it well, keep it compacted, it'll just keep on growing. It'll wilt for a few days, but it'll come right back. You mean the root? The whole plant will come. With no, if you snap it right off, but the roots are gone. No roots. You got a green stalk. You can plant that nine times out of ten if you water it, keep it, keep it well supported. The leaf part will come back. It'll come back. Thank you much. Uh, I'll see you this afternoon in the tent. We won't be out. What time? Thank you. Thank you.